let's begin from let's begin from here. Let's just remind ourselves a little bit about what was going on in the end of the fifth parak. And um, after the okay, so after the the short davening, then they did the pais for the ktoret, and uh, then the the kohanim who weren't working went in to change their clothes. And then beginning in the fourth Mishnah of the last parak, uh, we start to describe the process that leads up to the burning of the Torah and how the person who won the pious for the Torah, he takes uh, he takes the kaf, this uh, kli that's going to uh, that's going to be holding uh, it's going to be holding the bazakh which actually has the ktoret and then in the fifth mishnah in the last parakel it says misha zakhab mahta the person who was with the mahta and the mahta was this kind of uh, uh, coal shovel it was a silver coal shovel and he won by being next to the person who won the Ketoret. And he went and he got, he, um, he got the coals from the outer Mizbeach. And he shoveled off four kav of Gechalim. And then he poured them into a smaller, uh, a smaller kaf. Uh, made of gold that only held three gechalim, and then they had to get rid of the extra coals, and we talked about that. So, at the very end of the last chapter, it said, Higiyu ben ha'ulam v'lam So then they got between the ulam, which is the outer part of the Beit HaMikdash itself, in between the ulam and the mizbeach, and then one of them <clears throat> took this magrefa, which we discussed, some kind of an instrument that made a lot of noise. And they would throw that to make the noise. And, uh, and it served three, this, throwing the magrefa served three purposes that the ko- a Kohen who heard its sound knew, knew that his brothers, the Kohanim, were going in to bow down. And then he would also come in. Uh, he would run and come. Uh, a Levi who heard it, he would know that the Levim were going to go to do the shir, and he would also run and come. And that the head of the Mahmud would stand up the Tmeim at the eastern gate. So all of those things are sort of side issues, but I want to just remind us that this is what we were up to in terms of the chronology of what was happening in the Beit HaMikdash, that at this point, the, peop- the, the person who is going to be Maktir the Ketoret is there alongside the person who has the coals in the golden shovel, and they are now on the at the... Uh, at the foot of the steps that go into the ulam. So that brings us now to the beginning of the sixth chapter. So they started going up the stairs of the ulam. The ones who had won the pies for cleaning the coals off of the Mizbeach, and the, the inner Mizbeach, the Mizbeach uh, for the Ketoret, and the one who had won the pies for cleaning the Menorah, Hayu Makdimin Lifneham, they would then go in front of them. So the, the two people, although it's possible that there's three people, we'll see you later, uh, the people who are going to be burning the Ketoret were then preceded by the people who had been there earlier, 
who had done the Dishun Mizbeach HaPnimi and the Dishun HaMnora. If you remember, when they did those actions, they took off the, you know, respectively the coals and the, the excess oil and the um, wicks, respectively from the Mizbeach HaKtarot and from the Menorah, and they put those things in, each of them put them into a kli, right? And they left those kelim inside the Beit HaMikdash when they went out to participate in the davening. So now they're coming back. So they go in before, in front of the people who are going to be Maktir Ktoret and also uh, the person who's going to finish um, the person is going to finish the Dishun Hamnora. Uh, oh, he would have been one of them. So Misha Zacha B'Dishun Mizbeach HaPnimi Nichnas V'Natal Etateni V'Hishtachabeh V'Yatsa So the person who had before won the pais to clean the Mizbeach HaPnimi, he goes in, he takes the Teni, and he bows and leaves. So what was the tenny? If I recall, the tenny was the amount of ash that was... No, I'm not, that's not right. You're close, but no cigar. <laughs> the tenny was the name of the kli that he piled the ashes into. And he left the tenny there, right? That was back, hang on. So I got it was leftover ash. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the part you were close about. Uh, here, this is back in the third chapter. At the end of the third chapter, Misha Zacha B'dishun Mizbeach HaPnimi Nichnas B'natal HaTeni Bihi Nichol L'Fanav The person who is going to do the Dishun Mizbeach HaPnimi, he went in, he took the Teni, which was a kind of a metal basket, and Haya Chofen V'noten L'Tocho He would take with his, you know, uh, uh, handfuls of the Deshen that was on the on the Mizbeach HaKtoret, and he would put it into the Teni. And it says, Uvachrona kibedet ha-sha'ar. And then at the end, he would essentially just sweep off the rest, like when he could no longer grasp it in his hands. And he would sweep it into litocho, into it, into the Teni. V'hinicho v'yatsa. He would leave it and go out. And the Bartunu explained, he nichol the teni sham v'yatsa. He would leave the teni there and he would go out of him. Yad lo hayam motzio. He didn't take it out immediately. Shekevan shetzurich atet adesh and etzel hamizbeach kedma k'mod dishun hamnora mamtin ad liachar zrikat atamid. So he left it there because he had to put. He had to ultimately take the deshen and put it next to the Mizbeach, to the uh, east of the Mizbeach. And he had to do that along with the Deshen from the person who was cleaning the menorah. Uh, so, Mamtin Tamid, he would wait until they threw the blood for the Kurban Tamid. Shayahu Sehatavach Neirot, and the person who was doing the Menorah, who is going to clean the two Neirot, the Gomer HaShamati Shun HaMenorah, which we will talk about now in this sixth chapter. So then both of them would take, you know, respectively, the person who did the Mizbech HaKtoret, he would take the Teni, which has the Deshen from the Mizbech HaKtoret, and this one would take the kuz, which was more of a pitcher-like thing, but also its function was to hold the deshen and the wicks and so forth from the uh, uh, from the menorah. 
ושופכים הדשן במקום אחד, עץ המזבח, and they would pour that out next to the מזבח, ונבלעים שם במקומן, and then they would get that would get swallowed up, as it were, in, in, in its place. So when we were learning this, so we understood that it, so they, they had done the act of the Dishun of the Mizbech HaPnimi and the Menorah, respectively. And then they would keep the Kelim, where they gathered the, their Deshen, in the Beit HaMikdash until now, until we're getting to this point now at the beginning of the sixth chapter where now they're going to be taking care of it so it says um again so so this is where that person who had cleaned off the mizbeach he goes in and he takes this tenny and he bows and he goes out the person who had done the Dishun Hamnora, Nichnas, Umatsa Shne Nerot Mizrahim Dulkim. So he would go in and he would find the two uh, eastern lamps lit, Midashena Tamizrahi. What it means is if he found them both lit, right? So uh, then he would clean out the eastern one. He would leave the western one, in other words, the second from the east. He would leave that burning. That's the, that was the lamp that they would use to light the other lamps on the menorah later on at the, at the end of the day. If he found that it had gone out, then he would clean out that lamp and he would light it from the Mizbech HaOla, from the outer Mizbech. If he found, if what had gone out? The Western lamp. The Western lamp, right? So, and we're, we're going with the Bartanura's explanation that the menorah was placed going from west to east, and the the western the the second the second from the east is called the the Ner Ma'aravi. So if and we mentioned this before and when we were talking about the first part. So if you remember what he what had he done and what had the person who has to do Dishun Ham Nora. What had he done until now, before, right before when he and the he was doing the initial part of the Dishun Hamnora? Ham what was the first part of the Dishun Hamnora? He did the other the other lamps. The more uh, uh, I was going to, I'm not confused between east and west, but the other other lamp. Right, the ones that were further west. So. Um, Wait a second, I think I can give us a little illustration. Uh, yeah, okay, these are not, yeah, they don't have good illustrations. All of these illustrations have the menorah going from uh, north to south. But um, yes, the idea was that he, he was, when he, when he initially came in, without going through the whole Mishnah again, although eventually I think we will go through it all again and try to put it all together. But yes, his task at the beginning was to clean the five westernmost ones. And now his task is to finish cleaning the Mizbeach. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, his, this is his task now. So what what was he doing? So it, what what would happen now is if um, if he so if he goes and he finds that both of the eastern lamps, in other words, the east and the one next to it, which we call the Ner Ma'aravi, if both of them were lit, he would clean out the easternmost one. And he would leave the next one, the one next to it, he would leave that lit. 
because ultimately that's what they were going to light the menorah from when they come to light the menorah ben harbaim. But if he found that the second from the east, the Ner Maravi, if that had gone out, then he would clean it out and he would light it from the Mizbeach HaOla. That lamp, had, the Ner Maravi, had, if it went out, always had to be lit from the Mizbeach HaOla. Natal Takuz, Mima he took the kuz from the ku, the kuz being again the the kli that was holding what he had cleaned out from the menorah now uh, until now he would take it from the second step and he would bow down and go out right we mentioned uh, earlier at the end of the uh, at the end of the third chapter, that that's where he would leave it. Evan haitalif neha menorah uba shalosh malot. There was a stone in front of the menorah that had three steps. Shalla koeno made a etanero. He would stand on the top of the steps to clean out the nero. He would leave the kuz after he finished cleaning the mino- the, the first five. He left it on the second step. So now he's here. He's cleaned either both of the other uh, both of the other lamps, or at least one of them, right? So he, he's always going to clean the easternmost one. And if the second from the east had gone out, then he would also clean that, and then light it, and then he would take this kuz that had all of the uh, deshen and the extra oil and the tilim, and now he would bow down and take it out. Okay. So this describes what was done by the people who had, who had started the, their work earlier. One of them had cleaned the, the Mizbeh HaKtore, and one of them had cleaned the menorah. And they finished, well, the person who did, who had done the Mizbeh ha, ha Pnimi, he didn't actually have any more work to do, but as we mentioned in the third chapter, he waits to come in to remove his ashes with the person who's going to now finish cleaning the menorah. So the other person finishes his work on the menorah, and he bows down and he goes out. So now they are both out, and then they were followed, as we know, by the people who were going to now be bringing the coal. One person is going to bring coals, and the other person is going to actually uh, offer the incense. So the Bartanura, we'll just go through the Bartanura here. The Bartanura says, Hechelu Olin the Maalota Ulam. So these people started to go up the steps of the Ulam. Who were the people? Otam Shezachu Bechashel Ktoret, the ones who had won the pais uh, for the Ktoret. He would go up with his Kaf, which was the this Kli that held the Bazach and the Bazach held the Ketoret, so he was holding that going in. And the other person next to him now has this golden uh, shovel of coals. They're walking in. Uh, they would start to go up the stairs of the Ulam. There were, there were 12 steps that led to the Ula. That we can show you in a second. I don't know if the, the, this is the way it's pictured here. Um, right, so here's the Mizbeach. And then, right, so before this, they threw the Magrefa somewhere around here, or somewhere around here. 
don't know, between the Mizbeach and the Ulam. And that was like a sign that everybody, you know, for the Kohanim to do this, and the Levim to do this, and the Mamad to do this. And so the people who are doing the, uh, who are going to now offer the Ketoret, they start up the stairs, but they are preceded by the people who are going to be finishing cleaning the Mizbeach Ketoret and the Menorah. This is the opening to the Ulam. And then that leads into here. This is the Heichal. And here we have in the middle, we have the Mizbeach HaKtoret. And over here we have the Menorah. And they even put a stone with, with uh, three stairs next to it. So that's, that's the placement. So those people, uh, so the people who finished, who had gone, uh, they finished their Dishun Mizbeach HaKtoret and the Dishun Hamnora, they bowed down and they left. And then ultimately they're going to put the, um, they're going to put the Dishun from the Mizbeach and the Ketoret, uh, Mizbeach HaKtoret and from the Menora, they're going to put it somewhere around here next to the Mizbeach, that's where they, that's where it would get dropped off. Now the Mishnah is going to continue to tell us, uh, oh, but let's finish the Bartanur and then we'll go, we'll go into and start to, start to learn about exactly how the Ketorot was brought. Let's finish this first. Um, Okay, so the people who are going to do the ketoret and the person who has the coal, the person who's going to do the ketoret and the person who has the coals, they go in first. They go up the 12 stairs into the uh, into the ulan. Before them, would, they would be preceded by a the one the person who was who had done the dishun of the uh, so he's going to go in to remove the teni, this basket that had the dashen. Since he has to put the dashen next to the mizbeach on the east side, like the dishun of the menorah, as the bartender explained earlier, he would wait until after they threw the blood from the korban tamid. Shaya hazocha b'dishun hamnora oseh hatavat shtei neirot, so that 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 he that would also now be the time that the person who's going to do the dishun hamnora, he would now finish cleaning the the eastern two lights. The gomer hashlamat dishun hamnora. He would finish the completion of cleaning out the menorah. And then both of them would take out zehateni, the zehakuz. One of them would take out the teni, and one of them would take out the kuz. There, they took out respectively the kelim that held the deshen from the ketoret and from the menorah. The shovchim hadeshen b'makom echad etzah hamizbeach kedma. And then they would pour that deshen out on a in a particular place ne- ne- next to the mizbeach on the eastern side. Right. So the person who had the teni he would bow down and leave because now his mitzvah is, is finished. Uh, the person who has to do dishun hamnora he comes in and he finds the two eastern lights that are lit. And so, uh, uh, so if, he, if he found them lit, he would clean the easternmost one and leave the next to it, the Ner Ma'aravi. But Mitzao Shekaba, but if he found that, that it had gone out, if the Ner Ma'aravi had, come, had gone out, then he would clean it and light it from the Mizbeach HaOla. So, Mitzao Shekaba, so if he found that it had gone out, Kegon Le'achar Shemait Shimon HaTzadik, Shelo HaYahanez. 
how could it be that he found that it had gone out? So this would be after the time that Shimon HaTzadik had died, and there was no longer a miracle, because we had, what did we learn during the time of Shimon HaTzadik? What was the miracle? It never went out, the one candle. Right, so the Ner Maravi never went out, right? So another, it, it, it wouldn't go out for the entire span of the 24 hours. It would have to be relit at, in Bein Harabayim, but it would never have been out in the morning. And then it would be used to light the candles in the evening, and then it would have to be relit from the Mizbech HaOla. So this is obviously at a time if he found that the Ner Ma'aravi had gone out, this is obviously talking about a time after Shimon HaTzadik and the, the miracle no longer stood. Whether he found it had gone out now, after the Korban Tamid had already been shechted, as we described earlier, whether, or whether he found it had gone out before the Tamid had been shafted, and he had to light it, as we said earlier, as we said in the, in the parak that starts with the words, the first one, right? Because we have two, we have two prakim that start with the words Amar lehem hamimuneh. Just to remind you, we had Perak Hamishi that started with Amar lehem hamimuneh, and we also had the beginning of Perak Shlishi, oops, uh, that also started Amar lehem hamimuneh. So Amar lehem hamimuneh kama is the first Perak of um, that starts Amar lehem hamimuneh. So as we as we mentioned there, <coughs> even though now he finds that it's still lit, since the miracle was not was no longer extant, he would put it out and clean it. So that he could finish cleaning both of those two neirot at the same time. He would then light it from the mizbeach ha'ola, which is the outer mizbeach. Because you never, it would never be that the ner ma'aravi would be lit except from fire that came from the outer Mizbeach. Dichtiv, esh tamid tukad al Mizbeach, esh sheneamar ba tamid. Dichtiv, v'ha'alot ner tamid, ve'al Mizbeach ha'chitzon tukad. So let's just understand the, the drasha here for a second. Esh tamid tukad al Mizbeach, so we'll, we'll just, hold on a second, I'll bring these up. Okay, so uh, we've, we've now seen this many times, but let's just uh, look at it again. Uh, okay. So this is Parshat Shumat uh, and and uh, first it talks of, right, so what does it say? Tzavet Aaron ve'etpanav le'imor, zo Torah ta'ola hi ola o mokta o mizbeach kol vayla da'boker ve'esha mizbeach, Tukadbo. So this is uh, command Aaron and his son saying, this is the law of the Ola. This is the Ola that's on its place of burning on the Mizbeach all night until the morning. The Esha Mizbeach Tukadbo. And the fire of the Mizbeach is burnt on it. 
within it. So if Ashit, right, so then it says that he has to uh, wear special clothes and then he has to take off the deshin and put it next to the misbeach and then he takes off his clothes and he puts on other clothes. He takes the deshin outside of the camp to a, 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 um, a pure place, a tahor place. And now, ha'eshal misbeach tukad bo lo The fire on the misbeach Tukad bo will will burn on it. It it will not go out or does not go out. To be erle al kohen mitzim baboker baboker, and the kohen burns wood on it every morning. The aracha leholah v'ktir leal chobei shlamim. He then arranges on it on the fire um, the ola, and he also burns on it the fats of the shlamim. So the, the, the Pasuk says a fire, fire, the way we understand this is that a fire always burns on the Mizbeach, do not put it out. But here, when we're looking at it, the Drashat understands it a little bit differently. Um, So what's the drasha? It says Shein Madiki Ner Marivi. In other words, this we're going to learn from two, these two psukim, Esh to Mid to Karal Mizbech and La Lot Ner Tamid. We want to learn out that when one comes to light the Ner Marivi, it has to be lit from the Mizbech Ha'ola. So the first step is from this pasuk, Esh Tamid to Karal Mizbech. Esh shne marba tamid. So here we understood to be we understood that the pshat is that the tamid tells us that a fire has to always be burning on the mizbeach. But now we're understanding a little bit differently. Esh shne marba tamid. It's a fire about which is said about it, that it is tamid. In other words, this esh, this fire that's on the outer mizbeach, that's called the esh tamid. And then we have another pasuk that talks about lighting the uh, the ner ma'aravi, tichtiv lahalot ner tamid. So that's in uh, Kafdalot Bet, just a second. So here, Vaydeber Hashem El Moshe Lemur. Wait a second. Yeah. So here also we would have thought that the pshat of the pasuk is uh, you command uh, the children of Israel saying uh, uh, command the children of Israel and they sh- uh, and you should take for you shemen uh, zayitzach. Oil, uh, all, pure olive oil, which is a different interpretation of where the Zach refers to, but we'll just say, Katit Maor, that have been um, uh, crushed for uh, light, the Ha'alot Ner Tamid, to bring up the, the flame on the, on the Ner Tamid, to bring up the Ner Tamid. Hashel, there, yes. seems to, there seems to be a confusion between the Esh Tamid on the Mizbeach outside and the Ner Tamid of the Menorah. This one, this Pasuk obviously talks about the, the Ner of the Menorah. Hashem and Zayit, Zach, Katit, Lama'or, Lalot, Ner Tamid. This is, I, I, I assume, this is the Menorah. Yeah, so this is exactly the point. So the question is, when when the Torah here describes 
uh, the lighting of the menorah, it says, So what is, tam, what is, what is, what does ner tamid mean? So according to this drasha, I learn what ner tamid means uh, in the context of the tamid, the esh tamid. So what we established from the first part of the drasha is esh tamid tukad al mizbeach. Yeah, I'm back here. Esh tamid tukad al mizbeach. We said esh ne'amar ba tamid. It means the esh that we call tamid has to always be burning on the mizbeach. So now when I see this pasuk that tells me to light the menorah, it says, la'alot ner tamid. So what does it mean, la'alot ner tamid? It means to light this ner from an esh tamid. And where's the esh tamid? On the mizbeach. Outside, on the mizbeach. Yes. On the mizbeach. Does tamid here mean what we mean in Hebrew? Tamid, that it, it's all... It's all all the time. It's lit all the time. Or does it mean that it's the place where you do the korban tamid, which we do every uh, we bring a, every morning? So, it, 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 so first of all, the word tamid, uh, the word tamid actually has different meanings. Either either tamid means eternal in the sense of always without any interruption, or it means biikfiyut, right? Consistently. Actually, another way but, of putting is either, is either continuous or continual. Is it continue, what's the difference? Continuous means that it's sort of you know, nonstop all the time. Continual means sort of repeating at regular intervals. Okay, exactly. So that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. So here, but for our, so for our purposes, what's important is the fire that burns on the outer mizbeach is called the esh tamid. In fact, it was supposed to be continuous. It was supposed to always be burning. But what's important is that it's called the esh tamid, and then that's the that the, then then when i when i look at the pasuk that tells me i need to light the menorah it says ner tamid meaning tukad it has to be lit from the outer mizbeach meaning it has to be lit what does it mean what's a ner, what does it mean ner tamid it's a ner that's lit with esh tamid. It's a ner that's lit with fire that we call tamid. Because the menorah itself was, as Michael says, was continuous in its burning, but not, or I'm sorry, continual <laughs> in its burning. In other words, it, it, was in, it, was, it was consistently supposed to be lit uh, periodically had to be lit on a on an on a regular basis, but it but it did perforce at some point have to go out right because every day you're going to have to clean out the the menorah in order to relight it. So even the ner tam, even the ner ma'aravi, even during the time of Shimon Hatzadik. Where it was, where it would stay lit for the entire 24 hours, but it would still have to, at some point, be put out. Here we're talking in our Mishnah. We're still talking about what was happening in the morning. So this is in the morning. They're finishing the 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 person who's doing Dishun Ham Nora is finishing Dishun Ham Nora. If the if the Nerma Aravi had gone out. Then he would clean it out, and he would take esh tamid from the mizbeach hachitzon. He would take this eternal fire from the mizbeach hachitzon to light the ner tamid. 
uh, to light the ner, which we call the ner tamid, and we call it the ner tamid because it's lit from an esh tamid. Th there is an inconsistency because the, in the preceding Mishnah, which you, you read before, it says that if the ner amaravi is, is still uh, burning, it's still lit. Then yes. you don't touch it. So then it doesn't do right. anything. And, and here he says, no, it just they puts it out and, and cleans it up. And then, then no, no, so, it again. No, so I'll, now I'll, I'll try to clarify this. The Mishnah here says it gives two possibilities. If he came in and he found both the East and the Nerma Aravi were still lit, then he would only clean the eastern one. He would leave the Ner Ma'aravi, the second one, he would leave that lit. But Mitzao Shekaba, if he found the Ner Ma'aravi, had gone out by itself, then he would clean it and light it from the Mizbeach Ha'ola. And this was just to explain that when he lit, whenever he had to light the Ner Ma'aravi, it had to be lit from a fire that was taken from the outer Mizbeach. But here, we're not talking about what happened in the evening. This is in the morning. So in the morning, if the Ner Ma'aravi had gone out, he has to relight, he had, then he would clean it and relight it. But if it hadn't gone out, he would just leave it. He wouldn't do anything to it. Okay. Um, so then Natalata Kuzmi Malashniya, he would take the Kuz which held the Dishun Hamnora from the second step, Shal Shalosh Malocha Yulifne Hamnora, the second of the three steps that was in that were in front of the menorah. He would bow down and leave because now he had finished his mitzvah. So at this point, the Mizbech HaKtorit is cleaned of all of its, of its coals and whatever else had burnt there, the, the, uh, the Ktoret, the burnt Ktoret, and the Menorah has also now been cleaned, and there's one uh, one candle is burning, one lamp is burning. The Ner Ma'aravi is is burning, and then now we come to the beginning of the process for doing the Ketoret. Misha zacha So this is Mishnah Bet. Misha zacha b'machta. The person who had won the pies to take the coals with the machta, with the coal shovel, Savar et al hamizbeach. He would gather up the or pile up the coals onto the mizbeach. Right. So now he's in he's in front of the mizbeach apnimi, and he piles up his coals on the Mizbeach, and then he would flatten them out with the bottom of the machta, right? So he dumps the coals, presumably around the middle of the Mizbeach, and then he takes the bottom of this coal shovel and flattens them out, spreads them out. And he bows and he goes out. So he would pile up the coals that were in the machta and the coal shovel on the mizbeach for the ktoret. He would flatten them out with the bottom of the machta. So that the ktoret will not fall uh, uh, on the coals or beyond the coals. So he, therefore he flattens them out and spreads them out so that they're not slanted down and 
to different directions. Targum Fayarkut. In other words, what because what's the idea? They want the Torah to be evenly burnt across the coals. So if they're piled up in in a in a in a kind of a pyramid, <coughs> then the person who puts on the ketoret, some of the ketoret may not actually fall on coals. He might put it on, but then maybe it'll fall off of the coals. So he spreads out the coals so that he makes sure that the person is going to put the ketoret on. Wherever he puts the ketoret, it's going to burn. Targum vayarku urididu. The he's explaining the word rididan, right? That he flattens them out. Is we learn it from uh, in the Torah where where it says vayarku. The targum is rididu, right? So ridu is the same as um, rikua. The army is beachazahav hayamaktir. The lobetocha machta, and the ketara was burnt on the on the golden altar itself. The lobetocha machta, it was not burnt in this coal shovel. And he's pointing this out because of al bektarat shel yom kippurim, the ketara that was done on yom kippur hayemin niach hagechalim betocha machta, the alen hayamaktir on. Yom Kippur, as we'll see when we go back to the Mishnah in, Yom, in Yoma, he would put the ketoret on the coals while they were still in the coal shovel. He would he would burn them on the coals while they were in the shovel. And there, there wasn't this flattening out of the coals on Yom Kippur, right? Because he has to take that machta to go into the Kodesh Kodeshim. I think we'll do a little bit more, but I, I'm also, I think I'm also going to stop early tonight because I'm extremely tired. Okay, so, but let's, I think let's read through the next Mishnah and, and I think we'll leave it the deeper explanation for the beginning of uh, the next year. The one who won the pious for the Ketorah. So if you remember, there was a kaf, right? We discussed earlier. There was a kaf that held um, uh, three tar- uh, three kav, and then inside of that they would put this bazach, <coughs> and the bazach had a little bit, a little cover, and had some kind of a ribbon on top. And he w- so whoever has the ketorah, so he's holding the kaf, and inside of the kaf is the bazach that actually has the ketorah. So he would take the bazach from the kaf, he would remove the container that had the ketorah from the larger uh, kaf, the larger kli that held it, the not no la ohabo o le krobo, and he would give it to his friend or to someone close to him. Nit pazer mi menu litocho, if some of it had spread out, uh, scattered inside of it, not no lo bechofnav, he would give it to him with his with his fists. In other words, if, if, what, if what spread out? If what spread out into what? If the katorit spread out from the inner vessel into the larger vessel. Right, and then who would give it, who would give it to whom with his fists? I mean, presumably the person carrying the vessels would give it to the person who'd spread out the coals, or is it the other way around? Well, the, who's going to be... So one of them is going to be putting on, putting the ketoret on the Mizbeah. So he's the one who needs the ketoret, right? So if some... So 
even though the bazaar was was a, was closed, but it's possible because it was gadush, it was a completely full. It's also possible that some you know some of the Torah spilled into the kaf. So what would happen? The person who's going to offer the Torah, he removes the bazaar, and he gave the kaf to someone next to him. So if, some, if there was still some spilled ktoret in the kaf, the person presumably who's holding the kaf is now going to scoop that out with his fist and give it to him. In other words, he would give it, presumably put it back into the bazaar where the, the person who's going to actually maktir, be burning the incense is, uh, has, has the ktoret. Okay, so the idea is that you want to get the full measure of the ktoret. And then they, we would, uh, or they would uh, teach him. Be careful, lest you begin in front of you so that you don't get burnt. So, who's teaching whom? And, right, who's getting taught? If I recall, they would specifically ask for, a, for somebody who had never done the incense before to participate in the pious. So exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He's the person being taught, and I'm assuming the person who was assisting would be somebody more experienced who would teach. Right, or it could be that they had taught him, that the Kohanim had taught him before he came in. But the main thing is that, yes, exactly like what you're saying, the person is now going to offer the incense, never did it before, because you were supposed to only do it once in your life. So this is the first and maybe only time that he'll ever do it. So they would they would teach him that when you burn it don't begin in front of you lest you get burnt so what does it mean don't begin in front of you lest you get burnt don't begin what i'm assuming putting the incense on the coals nahon yes and so um, what's what's the problem if you begin in front of you I mean, either it flames up or smoke goes up, and so you want to be over to one side so that it's not sort of you going up, going up, and it's, it's not going up over his body and over his face. I would guess. But the the concern here is, first of all, it's interesting you bring that up, and we'll talk about it more next time about the smoke. But here it says they're worried that he's going to get burnt, not that he's going to get smoked. What? How would he but get if, burnt? If the, if the, I mean, if the smoke. I mean, it could just flame up. But the smoke could be, I mean, if it's, if it's a lot of heat, then that would be enough to burn him. Um, but, I, but, let, 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 but let's say let's say it's probably more like that it would flame up. And then, and then why would he get burnt? He if could he's stand, stand back. If he's standing in front of it and standing over it, then that would mean that he would be coming directly onto him. Well, if he, so if he doesn't begin in front of him, where will he begin from? to either side, but he won't. Or maybe from the far side. But the, what's, what's the point? Okay, but what's the point? I just want to, I want to tweak a little bit what you're saying. If he starts right in front of him, then that starts to burn. And then if he has to reach over it, what will happen? Out. He'll get burnt. So he starts from away from the, from the other side because he has all this Torah that he has to spread out over the coals. He doesn't start in front of him. They teach him, start from the end, right? Because he's a, he's a novice. Maybe he's not thinking, he'll just pour it out and he thinks he'll pour it out like this in front of him. But they say, no, start from there and come back so that you, your hand doesn't go over the burning incense. We'll, we'll discuss this in greater detail next time. Um, 
Kitril Meraded Viotse. It would start to spread out or, or go down and, and go Viotse uh, and go out. We'll discuss exactly what that means next time. Lo haya maktir maktir ad shehamimuneh omer lo hakter. So the person who's doing the burning of the incense did not actually start the burning until the mimuneh, the, the kohen who was in charge, told him hakter, burn the incense. Im kohen gadol, if the person who's burning the incense was in fact the kohen gadol, ha omer, Ishi Chohen Gadol Hakter. The Mumune would address him formally and say, My man, the high priest, burned the incense. As we saw when we learned in the Mishnah in, in Yoma, the Kohen Gadol was addressed in that fashion, Ishi Kohen Gadol. That was the formal address. Pashu Ha'am, then the people would leave. Then he would burn, the person who's burning the um, Torah would burn the Torah, and then he would bow and leave, right? Because he would have finished the mitzvah of burning the Torah. So, who would be the Am? Who's the people that would leave? Well, the, there's nobody in the Ulam besides the Kohanim. Well, so who was there? The Kohanim. So who had to leave? The Kohanim. The Kohanim. So here this term Am refers to the Kohanim who were inside of the Hechal. So who was with him at the beginning of this process? Who do we now know was with him at the beginning of, the, of right before he did the actual burning? Who was with him? So the person who's doing the final pre preparation of the menorah and the person who spread out the coals. Well, the person who did the final preparation of the menorah apparently left, right? Because once he finished the menorah, it says, Yishtachavaviyatsa. He bowed and he left. But yes, yeah, so the person who brought the coals, who else was mentioned? There was a Cohen that was carrying the, uh, the vessel for the um, incense. Oh, okay, but, okay, so he's the person who has to stay because he's the person who's being maktir. So there's him. There's the person who brought the coals. Who else was there? I don't think that there was, he was inside. I don't know. Huh? Well, not, not, so, it's, so you raise an interesting question. Was the mumune inside? Did he also come in and tell him or did he call from the outside? to tell him. But it's, let's say it's possible then that he was inside. And then we have a reference to yet another person where we said, the, right, the person who is going to burn the Ketoret, he took the bazakh from the kaf and gave it the ohavo o the krovo. He gave it, so he does, it doesn't say he gave it to the person with who, who brought the machta. He doesn't, doesn't say he gave it to the person who brought the coals. So apparently there was another Kohen who came in just to take the bazach from the, uh, just to take the kaf when the Kohen who's being maktir removes the bazach. So it's possible that there were as many as three other Kohanim with the Kohen is Maktir, because there's the Maktir, there's the person who brought the coals, there's the person who's going to take the Kaf, and then also he'll, that person who takes the Kaf presumably is the one who's going to give the Kohen Maha Maktir any excess Ktoret that fell into the Kaf. And then also possibly the Mumune was there. So all of those people have to leave because the Torah says that there, nobody's supposed to be in the Ohel Moed uh, at the time when the Ketorot is, is being uh, burnt. So we'll do all of this next time. We'll, do, we'll go over this in greater detail next time, and I'll bring some other related sources. But that's where, we, that's where we're up to now. We're at, up to the end of the burning of the Ketorot.
Where, where do they uh, explain the way you prepare the Ktoret? What, what you read every day? Uh, Pitum HaKtoret. Yes. Right. So that's the, that's a, the, the bright totes that lay that out. And you know what, maybe I think, I think we should look at that a little bit more closely. I'll try to prepare that separately. And it's interesting because the Pitum HaKtoret, the way it, it appears in the Sidur, um, it doesn't appear in that Nusach in any one source. The Nusach we have in the Sidurim, uh, as I, I haven't looked at this in a long time, but as I recall, it's like um, it's a melding of different Mikorot that we that all of that gets put together. I think it's mostly based on the way it's brought down in a Brita in the Yerushalmi, uh, but it's not it's not explicitly in the Mishnah. But I think we should take some time, right? Because it's something we say every day, and maybe we like to understand that a little bit better. So, Lee uh, Neder, I'll prepare that maybe for next time. Maybe what we'll do is we'll finish this, and we'll look at exactly how the Ketar was prepared. Uh, it's also Shayach Inyaneno on, on Yom Kippur, right? Because on Yom Kippur, they had to do special, right? They had to be uh, They had to they had to repulverize it for to make it daka mina daka for Yom Kippur. So we'll look at that next time. Okay, I think that's it for tonight. Uh, any last questions or comments before we go? Okay. Thank you all, all right. and Thank you. see you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye.